Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to finish off the Dialectic of Enlightenment with the last two chapters titled The Culture Industry and Elements of Antisemitism. But before jumping into it, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guignot. If you're new here, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way that makes them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe, comment. I'd love to hear from you. And yeah, be sure to subscribe because I at least release videos every single week and you want to be kept in the loop. If you aren't new here and you haven't already, subscribe or uh, like, share, you know, tell your friends that it really helps me out a lot. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcast, leave five stars, leave a review. If you found me on a podcast platform, you'll be able to find me on YouTube as well, where I sometimes release videos if you're into that at all. Or if you found me on YouTube, you'll be able to find me on any podcast platform pretty much where there shouldn't be any ads. So that's obviously good. And finally, if you want to help me out monetarily, you can do that via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. Now let's jump into this with the culture industry, at least the first chapter I'll be talking about in the second half of the Dialectic of Enlightenment. The culture industry colon enlightenment as mass deception. So they start out this chapter by writing that culture today is infecting everything with sameness. Now this occurs to such an extent that decorative, administrative, and exhibition buildings of industry differ little between authoritarian and other countries. So it is growing more and more difficult to actually tell the difference between these authoritarian and supposedly non-authoritarian countries to the point that those in power, or how they put it, those in charge, don't even try to hide the kind of power that they wield over the social order to impose this kind of homogenization, this, this uh, development of a certain sameness. And so those cultural zones, what maybe we could even think about in terms of architecture, nobody thinks that there's any art potential there anymore. And this extends to film, radio, television. There's no art potential there. Everybody knows it. It is just for industry. It is just for the accumulation of profit. And all of this makes people ripe for authoritarianism because we submit to everything with a smile. And there's a certain comfort when everything has been reduced to a kind of conformism because you don't need to think about anything. You just do the same thing as everybody else, and that is it. And it alleviates the burden of having any kind of real individuality for Adorno and Horkheimer. So they take the radio, and the same can apply to television as well. But what these communicative media do is it turns listeners purely into that, just listeners. There's no opportunity to respond. Now they give the example of like calling in for uh, to, to earn a prize or something, which is just a kind of packaged up opportunity to give yourself the semblance or to provide the semblance that you are participating, you are responding to the system. Now, I think that the same can be said of new techno, I guess, new communicative media that have emerged like Twitter, or YouTube, where people do have the opportunity to respond whether or not that those responses actually motivate anything is certainly up for debate. And it seems more likely that 99.99999% of responses in, in any given case just disappear into the ether of the internet. But I'd be curious what anyone else has to think if you think that maybe this is a return to some kind of enlightened potential in the way that they celebrate enlightenment to some extent, or if it is just an extension of the same, just artificial chance to respond to a message, artificial participation. So if you're listening on YouTube, you know, comment. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Now, this general homogenization is not just present in the masses or among the masses. Even those that are, quote unquote, the rulers for Adorno and Horkheimer submit to this kind of ordering where they are very clear that film producers are dependent upon the banking system or how broadcasting is dependent upon electrical companies. So there's, there's this gravitation towards industry in the production of art that sort of grounds the potential for that art, which they say, to some extent, determines the limits of that art. And this reveals the extent to which capitalist interest far exceeds any kind of cultural interest. So choices here are purely artificial because it's just about choosing between two, maybe two different shoes or two different pairs of pants. And no matter what you choose, you are choosing capitalism. You are choosing exploited uh, workers for your product. 
Now, historically, art has been something that has, and we discussed this in the last episode, art is something that is both tethered to the kind of dominant system, but also presents an avenue to escape that system. Now, in this world, in the culture industry, in the way that they're describing it, all that art seeks to do is mirror the world in all of its banality. And so all we see in art is the kind of reproduction of the same kind of reproduction that occurs on a massive scale among people and among objects in the world, to the point that the particular and the general become indistinguishable, where all things are connected to a certain totality by which anything can gain its recognition. So nothing can stand alone. It always has to be measured in relation to the center, in relation to the conforming total. Now, whereas with art, historically, there was a tension between the particular and the general, art could be a moment of the particular that challenged the general or revealed a fundamental truth about the general. Now that is not allowed. That is not permitted. There's a kind of harmony that occurs between the two. Now, if you're getting the sense that Adorno and Horkheimer are just two grumpy old, old dudes who just don't seem to understand the transgressive potential of art, I would certainly agree with you. In many cases, Adorno and Horkheimer are victims of the same system that they are decrying here, in that they are only looking at everything through the system that they have so eloquently repudiated to the point that they fail to see those sites of resistance, fail to see those moments that oppose the system. Because for them, again, going back to last episode, any kind of transgression that exists within the system only serves to maintain that system in the long run. And for them, in terms of art, what this comes down to is a, an oversaturation of style, an oversaturation of culture, to the point that culture, at one point being the thing that opposed so-called barbarism, is now itself an arbiter for various barbaric tendencies, like, like a certain ordering, like the crystallization or the possibility of the Holocaust. And I'm going to talk about this next week when I cover uh, Theodore Adorno's education after Auschwitz. But entertainment for them and art, at least how it is understood in the culture industry, is meant to do more than just pump people full of banality. It is meant for the, I guess, probably the most part, to make people productive. It is meant to keep people in line, and it is meant to serve as a distraction from people's alienated lives, because otherwise they would grow extremely dissatisfied with their with their lives. So as we know from the work of Karl Marx, the uh, proletariat, the workers, will usher in communism by virtue of their, or in response to the kinds of suffering that they are inflicted or that is inflicted against them under capitalism. Now, I don't think Marx correctly understood the ways that entertainment, and I think that this is what Adorno and Horkheimer are getting at here, entertainment would be used to stifle that revolutionary instinct in order to make people passive and to accept the situation that they're in. But in an even more pernicious way, the ways that entertainment are so quick to depict things like violence in order to drum up a kind of cathartic response or to make people or to invest people within the, the artwork or within the television show or movie or whatever, with the violence that we see comes another problem at least for Adorno and Horkheimer, and that is that it makes us forget or it desensitizes us to the kinds of violence that occur on a daily scale in perhaps less fantastical ways, but no less serious ways. So in film and television, we have stuff blowing up, we have people with guns running around, inflicting damage upon others, and that in our mind comes to stand in for what violence looks like. Now, one of the horrors about you know, the probably one of the worst events in human history, that is the Holocaust, it was conducted in a way so as to minimize violence. And what I mean by that is that it happened on such a statistically perfect scale that the violence com committed could happen on such a, a massive scale without people knowing about it. Now, I'm very much aware that people in Germany knew about it and that there many people just lied about not knowing about it. But so long as people are focusing upon the violence as being these magnificent, overzealous demonstrations of force, then we become 
uh, we, we fail to see the ways in which violence occurs in much more or much less direct ways or much less overt ways, but that by virtue of that can be so much more deadly. Or if we just take the ways that workers are exploited on a massive scale in ways that, you know, it isn't romantic. It can't be something that's totally fetishized, like uh, a warrior's suffering in battle as it is depicted on television or military people as they're depicted in films. The horrors that people live are cast into banality in relation to the fantastical ways that they are depicted on television. Now, to give another example, uh, and this is something that many feminists have written about, is the way in which violence inflicted against women on film and in film and television is depicted in very specific ways. So one example would be like uh, women fearing sexual assault are taught to fear walking down dark alleys at night or taught to fear, you know, strangers at night. Now, of course, these are things that women always have to be mindful of because that's the world that they are raised into or they are taught to be mindful of that. But for the most part, the kinds of violence inflicted on women happen mostly by people they know, in many cases people they love, behind closed doors where they are assumed to be safe. And it doesn't assume this kind of fantastical quality of uh, someone in a dark alleyway. So by focusing on these extreme versions that are afforded to us by entertainment, then we lose sight of the ways that they occur on a much more massive scale in much more pernicious ways, which is what the culture industry is so good at doing, distracting from its own violences by erecting other ones as being worse. But in any case, to continue on with what they argue about here, they think that en entertainment marks a kind of proliferation. So for them, with the proliferation of, of sex comes the end of sex, for example. Like in pornography, for example, it is hardly the demonstration of what sex actually looks like, but it comes to stand in for what that is or what it should be. And when entertainment offers up such fantastical qualities, we become, in a sense, beholden to it. It dictates when we laugh. It dictates when we cry. So there are the basic formulas for certain films, like there's the rom-com or, you know, there's the action film of which we know how it's going to end. In the rom-com, the uh, attractive young woman who's moved out to the country is obviously going to end up with the rugged dude who's kind of standoffish at first. Like, obviously, in the action film, the hero is going to get away at the end and probably save some damsel in distress, and that's just the way that it's going to go. And so because of this, because of this kind of rhythmic function, there is a a need to always elevate the stakes, at least in its fantastical presentation, in the use of special effects or whatever to keep people interested. And so we are kind of held in a state of limbo when we engage with entertainment on any given, uh, any given film or any given television show we might watch because we know what's happening, yet we still find ourselves attached to it because of the images, the, the kind of shiny images that occur. And all this is in the service of, well, for them, in their words, the liberation which amusement promises is from thinking as negation. So it keeps us from actually thinking about anything because thinking is dangerous or thinking as negation as a chance to oppose oppression, to oppose the system. It alleviates that burden so that we could just sit on the couch and watch television and be completely absorbed by it. Now with this comes a general profusion of comfort and joy. Now I think that they definitely overplay this because there still is a great deal of suffering that occurs in this system. While in, this, in the kind of um, location that they describe, notably in the West, we might be able to say, even though I wanna put a big asterisk here and say that this is not the case, but from their vantage point, they might be able to say, oh well, you know, no suffering is occurring under this system because people are submitting to television, entertainment, and all that. But they're obviously disavowing the fact that people all across the world are suffering so that other people in the West can live somewhat comfortable lives, even though that is not true at all. People are suffering on a massive scale today and even at the time, but of course they weren't necessarily aware of that. Not to mention the ways in which people are violence is inflicted against them on the basis of race or gender. But if we accept what they're saying in the idea that there's this profusion of joy, this kind of excess of joy and comfort, 
then the system confronts an issue because that will produce a sort of discomfort in the long run. And so what it does is it injects kind of like a pressure valve or as a kind of inoculating device or an immunizing device, it injects tragedy, it injects chaos in very manageable doses so that people think that their joy is something that isn't going to last. And so they better enjoy it for as long as possible and as hard as possible. And whenever this kind of chaos emerges, it only serves to strengthen the dominant order or the regular, you know, quotidian uh, way of being in the world that has submitted to this logic. Now, any kind of demonstration that we exert or we present uh, to demonstrate, a demonstration to, to demonstrate, to de demonstrate our individuality is purely artificial. And it comes down to them simply as pseudo individuality. It isn't an individuality that demonstrates oneself in any real way. It is just an individuality that is predicated upon what the market has allowed for, of what the culture industry has allowed for. So you demonstrate oneself in one's clothes or what clothes you wear. But of course, that is ultimately determined by conditions of the system itself. So any branding that you choose to, to um, I guess, put on or to present yourself with is just a branding for the system itself. And what this does is it really speaks to the way that the whole culture industry is just a big advertisement for itself. All films, all television are just advertisements for other films and other televisions or <laughs> other television shows. TVs are advertisements for other TVs, but in any case. And if anyone knows anything about advertising or PR generally, the message has to be as clear as humanly possible. There isn't any room for metaphor. And because metaphor is the moment that language goes beyond language. You know, the thing that is being conveyed goes beyond the literal meaning of the words, which is complicated. And so advertising steers away from that and it makes its image as simple as possible, appealing to base instincts like sex or hunger or whatever. Or hatred is a good one too. In order to drum up support in order to drum up interest in a product. And so they conclude this chapter by saying that in the culture industry, personality means hardly more than dazzling white teeth and freedom from body odor and emotions. So there's a kind of sanitization occurring, a submission to this ideal that tries to, in every, with every breath it can muster, to get away from what it means to be human, which means to be messy. It means to be emotional. It means to have feelings. It means not to be perfect, whereas this system is trying to craft people in this image of perfection that can make it so that they want to buy more stuff and exist more within the system so that they can uh, kind of attain that ideal. And that propels us here into the last chapter, Elements of Anti-Semitism, The Limits of Enlightenment. Enlightenment. God. I, I forgot how to talk today. Now, this chapter is going to discuss anti-Semitism, specifically the motivations behind the Holocaust. And I want to say that, obviously, this is extremely heavy subject matter. This is, this is a very difficult thing to talk about. But I don't think that Adorno and Horkheimer do as much justice to this issue as I think they could have. They do a good job, but there are moments in how they talk about anti-Semitism that seems to reduce, at least to me, really the motivating factors behind the Holocaust. But I'll get into that as we go through it here. So for them, German fascism and other fascisms across Europe, because it would be very wrong to say that it was just Germany that were uh, comprised of anti-Semites. All across Europe, people had a general disdain for, Jew for the Jewish people for many centuries and across the world for many millennia before the Holocaust. But German fascists for Adorno and Horkheimer, for them, viewed, uh, they viewed the Jewish people as a kind of anti-race. So they were something that had to be exterminated because they opposed things like nationality. They opposed things like ethnic identity. Now for others, you know, people who didn't maybe necessarily identify as anti-Semites or weren't overtly uh, they didn't overtly hate Jewish people, they would often resort to saying that like, oh, well, the Jewish people are just 
uh, a religious group without a nation, of course. And, you know, they see themselves as just describing some kind of situation. But it is by virtue of the Jewish people's placelessness that that posed a threat, essentially, to the totalizing order. Because in this idea of Jewish people not having a homeland or not having a nation to which they could be uh, kind of ascribed to or they could be attached to, they were then seen as being threatening to the social order or the uh, development of a totalizing logic that sought to encapsulate everyone. So the Jewish people were seen as the threat to that because they were seen as being outside of that system. Now, with this, certain governments all across Europe were able to drum up fear against Jewish people because they were seen as being a threat to the possibility of a certain totalizing logic, which is totally irrational, of course. It, you know, persecuting the, the, the Jewish people does not do anything to help the so-called average person. It does not help human beings, but kind of assuages their urges to destroy. That is, it, it takes over their, or it um, satiates, it satisfies their uh, urges to destroy where on a general level and among the masses there was a desire to to destroy things which is a result for adorno and horkheimer of this logic of enlightenment that seeks to dominate that seeks to take over again this is from the last episode when we're talking about it in terms of kant's work if something doesn't i guess um, relate or properly correspond to your reason it can then be seen as a threat to you so you can do what you want to it. You can take it out. Now, because of this, Adorno and Horkheimer say the first thing that, that rubs me the wrong way, and that is that it could have been any group then that suffered this kind of injustice because there is no logic to the idea that Jewish people are somehow outside of the system and therefore there's some kind of justification for their persecution or a justification to drum up the fear to motivate that persecution. There's no logic to that. Because, and they say, any group could suddenly, could be kind of replaced here. And indeed, others were. Uh, you have Roma people as well that were um, obviously persecuted, among, among others. But the problem for me when they say this is that it seems to be a historical reduction of the ways that Jewish people have historically been discriminated against. It wasn't just like out of the blue one day, uh, rulers picked a, an ethnic group or picked a group of people out of a hat and said these are the people we're going to scapegoat it's not as simple as that and they continue this line of thought saying that the people that that is you know non-jewish people's hatred of jewish people was actually them demonstrating their hatred against capitalism and this is why jewish people were associated with money now given the historical condemnation of the jewish people they had to work extra hard to make it anywhere in the world. And so their success was seen as a kind of complicity with the system. Now, it's totally ironic here and it's totally backwards because if you're listening, you might say, oh, well, I thought that they were persecuted because they were seen as being outside of the system. Well, that's the effective thing. That is the, the trick of the system is that it convinces people that its enemies are outside of it, when in fact the enemies are within it, which it can then say are within it and construct itself as its own enemy, and this is part of the dialectical movement, so that it can better maintain itself by motivating these kind of chaotic events, these moments of irrationalism to more, uh, to strengthen the center, to strengthen those people that are associated with it or that actually benefit from it. Now, of course, it is problematic to lend any credence to this idea that the Jewish people were associated with money in any way, and therefore that was served as a kind of basis of their being discriminated against, because again, the condemnation of Jewish people far precedes any of this. So it seems to be kind of a reduction. Now, they pay a little bit more attention to the historical, more of the historical factors as we go on here, but still, I just want to stress those points because i think that they adorno and horkheimer fall short of actually encapsulating why the jewish people were discriminated against in such a specific way and for more on this i think a book that does this much better and they you know they only dedicate a chapter to this so there's no way we could expect that they're going to get this long historical genealogy of the persecution of jewish people but hannah arendt's the origins of totalitarianism does a really good job at demonstrating just how all of these countries around Europe 
were uh, discriminating against and persecuting the Jewish people and the history that motivated it. Now, in order to give the kind of history that they, Adorno and Horkheimer, now proceed to give, they go back to the Bible and they look at the difference between the Old and the New Testament. And that is the difference between Judaism and, and uh, Christianity. Now, this is incredibly complicated, the way that they talk about this, and I want to do my best, at least in the way that I best understand it, to convey it to you. So they associate the Old Testament with a notion of transcendence. Now, transcendence in this context means a going beyond the self, going beyond humanity, going beyond the physical world into something out of it. So in the Old Testament, for those that don't necessarily know, uh, <laughs> there are these long sequences where Moses is communicating with God without actually seeing him upon Mount Sinai. I think it was Mount Sinai. But anyways, uh, communicating with God and God is relaying to him all of the stuff he needs to do in order to prepare the children of Israel that would be uh, kind of formed under Jacob, I guess. Uh, and my memory of it is foggy. Uh, formed under Jacob to form this, I guess, the people of Israel who will be God's children. So there's a distance here between humanity and God. There's a very strict separating line where, you know, humans cannot ever go into God's domain and God only ever communicates to the people via certain, certain people in certain instances. Now with Christ, with Jesus Christ, what we have is the actual personification of God. Now, this is, there's some issues here because we have to assume that Jesus and God are one and the same person. Some, you know, some of us are led to believe that Jesus is the son of God, but in other points, it is clear that Jesus and God are one and the same thing. But anyways, in any case, what we have is the deity assuming a human form. So they associate this with a kind of imminence instead of transcendence, where it all comes back down to humanity, to humanity in the way that it knows itself. So at this moment within Christianity, God and humanity become somewhat homogenous. They, they come to resemble one another, giving religion a kind of natural quality, one that, that can be used to justify a natural order that is used to only maintain a certain status quo, a dominant status quo. And so having that on their side, having order on their side, Christianity and, and the many kind of branches of it could then justify this persecution of others who did not abide by it. And it was given a sort of, by virtue of its imminence, it was given a kind of transcendent status, which is a complicated idea, but it was given a certain privilege because it was associated with nature. It was associated then, therefore, with a kind of truth. So it could then be used to persecute others who failed to abide by it. So in their words, anti-Semitism is supposed to confirm that the ritual of faith and history is justified by ritual, ritually sacrificing those who deny its justice. So to put that into English, anti-Semitism or the hatred of Jewish people is a way by which to demonstrate or to almost sacrifice those who fail to abide by the ordering principle that comes out of this kind of imminence through the New Testament. Now, this kind of becoming of God into human, this becoming human of God, does not resemble mimicry in the way that they talk about it in the first half of the book, uh, in, as they located it, locate it in the world of magic. This is instead a, a provocation for something else to become you. So it's making the world become you, not you becoming things in the world. So because of that, so because people are forced to conform, this extends, of course, to the Jewish people who have to abide by the system to some extent in order to live in it, just like everybody else. But the, you know, the non-Jewish people are able to construct the Jewish people in such a way as to make it seem like they are the ones that are wrong with the system. They're the ones that are the demonstration of capitalism's evil. And so they must be eradicated. Now, of course, all that is actually happening here is everyone else doing the exact same thing as the way the Jewish people are being instructed is doing, you know, uh, they, the, the non-Jewish people say uh, the Jewish people are acting in this way, which is wrong, so therefore they should be persecuted. But of course, the ways in which they do that are just a kind of projection. The regular people or regular people, the, the other people, the non-Jewish people are just projecting the very things that they are doing upon the Jewish people so that they can kind of absolve themselves of the guilt that they feel 
for doing those things, even though there's absolutely nothing guilty about to feel guilty about. This is just bad conscience uh, a la Nietzsche. So in Adorno and Horkheimer's words, they say that they, non-Jewish people, detest the Jewish the Jews and imitate them constantly. There is no anti-Semite who does not feel an instinctive urge to ape what he takes to be Jewishness. Now, this reveals that there's nothing actually wrong with any of the ways that any of these people are acting in the world. It only becomes wrong when the wrong group is doing it. Now, I, you know, this kind of dovetails with my own work a little bit, talk, uh, working on conspiracy theories. But this is a common thread, or this is a common theme, I should say, in the history of conspiracy theories, where conspiracy theories often depict the conspirators in a way that makes them almost want to be the conspirators. So they say the conspirators have a bunch of power. They're organizing, they're plotting, they're doing all these things that kind of tacitly, um, that kind of tacitly the conspiracy theorist wishes they themselves could do. But anyways, that's a digression. So the Jewish people were persecuted for reasons that made absolutely no sense, and it wasn't because of anything they were doing, but because it was the Jewish people that were doing it. So, for example, Hitler can jump around and scream and dance when he gives his stupid speeches, but he's not seen as being a clown, even though he is a clown in every way. But if anyone else were to do that, they would be seen as being a vagrant or uh, someone in need of uh, some kind of medical intervention. And so to speak more about this projection of desire onto the Jewish people, Adorno and Horkheimer write that the popular nationalist fantasies of Jewish crimes, of infanticide and sadistic excesses, of racial poisoning and international conspiracy precisely define the anti-Semitic dream, because that's what the anti-Semites absolutely want to do. They want to be doing those things. And so this is a kind of false projection for them. This is an imposition of one's own desires upon another and because you are not allowed to embrace your desire in this world you then have to condemn that other who seems to be the site of that desire and all of this just reveals the extent to which there is this homogenization this reduction of the other to oneself and in their words they write that he creates everything in his own image he seems to need no living thing yet demands that all shall serve him and this lack of connection to the world and to others and this desire to control it, to make it your own, to make it just like you, creates a sense of alienation from oneself and from the world. Now, they say that these false projections could have been a, an early evolutionary survival mechanism because you were, if you are able to project your own fantasies upon others or the things that you want to be doing upon other people's intent by saying that it is them that want to be doing this, you can prepare yourself and the people around you for possible attacks that you wish to inflict upon others. And for them, it is just the sign then of a kind of early stage human survival mechanism, and it has no place in enlightenment. But of course it does, because enlightenment brings with it the very elements of anti-enlightenment it claims to do away with. And so they say that philosophy is almost a way to challenge this system, to challenge these tendencies of false projection. But of course, we can't lose sight of the fact that Heidegger, one of the most noted uh, philosophers of the 20th century, was an avid anti-Semite who believed very much in this idea about a Jewish conspiracy taking over the earth. And so we have to ask, how effective is philosophy really at challenging these, these beliefs, these prejudices? But in any case, it is only by curing this kind of paranoia that has emerged of conspiracy, of anything like that, that anti-Semitism can be cured. Now they get really problematic in that they say that they don't actually believe that anyone was anti-Semitic per se. They think that it was almost just trendy at the time to hate the Jewish people, and people saw themselves not really as being anti-Semitic or really hating the Jewish people, but being part of the bourgeois and being rebellious. You know, it was a way for them to get their stake in the system. But of course, this totally forgets the way that the Jewish people were discriminated against long before the crystallization of capitalism. And so we have to definitely keep that on the back burner. So in the face of all of this, they kind of, they don't really give many solutions, but in their closing line, they, they say that enlightenment might be the chance to oppose these tendencies, to, to kind of get away from 
paranoia, to get away from these kind of superstitious prejudices or discrimination. But of course, we have to we have to problematize that a little bit. But in any case, they hold faith for the possibility of enlightenment to challenge even enlightenment, to challenge the ways that it has been operationalized to motivate hate. So it's kind of like in uh, a Marxist way, you know, with Marx saying capitalism will bring about the end of capitalism. It is perhaps true that enlightenment will bring about bring upon the end of enlightenment. And that's more or less it. Uh, if anyone listened this far, I, I hope you enjoyed it. If there's anything I excluded, I'd love to hear about it. Anything I got wrong, I would also love to hear about it. If you like what I did, like, share, subscribe. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, leave five stars, leave a review. I'd love to read them. I don't have the time to respond to everyone's comments and reviews, but I, I love reading them. They mean a lot. And yeah, catch you next time. Take care.